Good morning, everybody. When I wrote my bachelor thesis in 2007, I was the same age as many of you sitting here today. I was 21. That summer, I stood at the gates of the Anglican Cathedral in Liverpool with no idea what the future would hold for me. There I was, armed with a dissertation on Adorno and Horkheimer, and a growing sense that I was already on my way to something else and ready to carry those ideas out into the world. I opened my dissertation with a quote from Ludwig Wittgenstein, which has a special relevance as this year is the 60th anniversary of the publication of his philosophical investigations. It read, I quote, when we think of the world's future, we almost always mean the destination it will reach if it continues to go in the direction we can see it going in now. Never does it occur to us that the path of history is not a straight line, but a meandering curve, constantly changing direction." Unquote. Not only is this a typically profound meditation on the telos of history by that great philosopher, but it reveals something about the embodiment of ourselves within what we understand as history. My parents, who are here today, along with my two oldest brothers, and my sister, who's watching on the internet at home, brought me up to believe that you should never accept the world as you find it. And here is our connection to Wittgenstein, to see ourselves as the motor and locus of history, rather than as bystanders who sit back and acquiesce to the state of the world we are attempting to navigate our way through. I could follow this by reaching for all manner of platitudes about ambition, believing in yourself, following your dreams, but I often find these sentiments suspicious in a world of advertising, marketing, PR. Nevertheless, this kind of language is here to stay and it's with us in our institutions and places of work, embossed on headed paper, written above entranceways, websites, on certificates, on all the paraphernalia of a university as it seeks to make a name for itself under a clear aphorism. Here, that phrase is, inspiration is a place, at my former university, it was dream, plan, achieve. Perhaps these catchphrases might sound better in Latin. What we can glean from them, though, is something crucial to the philosophical armory of a university, that optimism, ambition, inspiration, and fairness are priceless facets in any society and in any educational structure. Optimism. Optimism's in short supply in today's world of 24-hour rolling news. A steady stream of misery from all corners of the world that if, like Nietzsche told us, we were to allow our sympathies to erupt, we would no doubt atrophy at the state of perpetual crises in the world, but we don't. Why? Because optimism is a vital tool for the future. And lessons of the optimism of the past can equip us with a resource when facing contemporary challenges. I know my parents' generation know all about this. Growing up in the aftermath of the Second World War, when solidarity, welfare, and the conviction that this would never happen again was the utmost concern. But here we are, speeding headlong already a decade into the 21st century, indeed a university of the 21st century. And all you people out there are about to head out into it in the hope of fulfilling your potential, reaching your goal, following your dreams, see? I'm doing it now. Does optimism come from the fact that any conviction towards a principle of freedom, of love, of hope, of goodness, has to begin with an acknowledgement of failure? To acknowledge failure is a strange thing to hear myself say, but it remains the strongest barometer to live by when we need to be active agents in the world, extending our hand, trusting others to find resolutions building bridges and casting off our prejudices. It's a challenge for all of us. There are no clear signposts out of university, no one defined path you can walk straight onto. Our careers or prospects are the result of a unique education that all of you have achieved here. The image of it will change as you grow older and you reflect back upon your time here. For some, it's the place where your son or daughter has been studying perhaps only thought of when the Skype call comes in or when the bill arrives. For others, it's a place of work where a career is being carved out. For some, it's a place that just pays the bills 
but for us students, it's a launch pad to an adult life, where once equipped with these indispensable tools, we can achieve wonderful things. But what makes a university? Well, imagine you're zooming in on Google Earth. When you land on Jacobs University, what can you see? The admin building, where all the letters get signed, the forms organized, the events planned, the admissions taken care of, it's the engine room. From there, you can see the four research buildings, where the engineers and scientists are working on helixes, isotopes, cell cultures, checking against immutable laws from old white fathers. You have the computer whizzes, deciphering, encrypting, writing in a language that no one else knows. You have the social scientists, working out the ideal time of day to be most fruitful with writing a thesis. <laughs> then there's the humanities students, my comrades, who, whilst the engineers are busy working out the structural laws of bridge building, we're the ones asking what a bridge could represent in society. <laughs> What's the history of bridge building? And how does the idea of bridge work as a metaphor? <laughs> Next comes the library, the central hub of academic life. A wonderful place for some, unmentionable boredom for others. We move towards the colleges where lives are being led, loves are lost and found, where the kinds of conversations take place that alter the course of a life. There's the interfaith house, offering solace and a place of worship for people who want that quiet retreat from the hustle and bustle of a busy schedule. And then, of course, there's the buildings where we really come alive, the theater, the sports field and hall, the music rooms, the dance halls. This is the missing piece of the jigsaw. Without these things, the world would be black and white, and we could not hold a mirror to ourselves and learn who we really are. So the beauty of all this is there's no one Jacobs University. It's made by those who work here, constructed in the minds of those who want to give their all to it and make it more than just the sum of its parts. Jacobs is fashioned by those who recognize its possibility in affecting great change now and in the future. For the professors, teachers and staff, they have the privileged status of those who will never know where their influence stops. Many years from now, I know there will be a moment when a small email is typed up, a message from a former student to a former professor, thanking them for that inspirational lecture or that course or that module. I know already that I will never underestimate the value of what my professors have taught me here, and I will never forget them. But what makes an education? Do we educate ourselves to make better use of our leisure, as Aristotle knew? Or is this a reductive opposition we could do without? It's certainly more than certificates, modules, lectures, theses, presentations, lab reports, quizzes, forms. What I want to say goes beyond the boundaries of a university. It's at the heart of any discussion about society, about rights, obligations, responsibilities. It's in the duty of inheritance from one generation to the next. At the entrance to the Rhymer Lust Hall, you see the words from Klaus Jacobs. It's a very simple statement, easily parodied. But I want to reassert that once more here today. Everyone, rich or poor, man or woman, young or old, has the right to a good education. Those qualities that future employers will be looking for are those curious things that can't be taught in a classroom. Civility, trust, a good work ethic, generosity, willingness to listen, an awareness of the other side of the argument, and respect for those who have fundamentally different views, beliefs, or creeds. We are all individuals, but through our diversity, we can create a unity that is more powerful than any imposed doctrine. That's what a great university can give you. That's what Jacobs University stands for. So you all know what it takes to get on. You've been faced with other cultures, other tongues, other ways of doing and seeing things. Yes, having a collective language facilitates this coming together. But you all know how important your languages are. Each person with his or her own worldview. Thank you, Professor Trabant. How dull would it be if we all ate the same food in the same way at the same times? How boring would life be if we had to submit ourselves to a world that doesn't celebrate diversity, individual talent, and the power of the multitude? In an increasingly globalized world, 
where you're never more than 300 metres from your nearest Starbucks or McDonald's, I've got many reasons to feel angry at what I see. But the world will only go in the direction it's going in now if I don't count myself as part of it. Everyone has a part to play in refashioning the world. And what better time to reassert this idea than at graduation? Among fine minds furnished by a unique education, proud parents and relatives, and a university that is working so hard to prepare the students for a life that will really make a difference. There's no other place like it. And here's the great thing. When it comes to the life of a university, for Jacobs, it's really on the beginning. Thank you very, very much. You might as well stand up as well. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our university choir. Fresh from their tour in Venice, this is the real deal, folks, so get ready for this. Please welcome to the stage Jacob Heller. <laughs> 